That transformative division, which obviously the, uh, the, 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 the sun has, etc., is more limited in terms of your appeal and what you're coming around here, etc. Anyway, the second thing, of course, is the stability. Even as it has thin, you will find it something quite remarkable. In any country in which you had a continuity of even macro level of democracy, let's not exaggerate this democracy. In India, at the macro level, remarkable stability of many institutions of liberal democracy and this thing here, at the meso and micro level, credible undemocratic brutality and violence. No doubt about it. Huh? Not like liberal democracies. In liberal democracies, for all the criticisms you can have of Trump or whatever, you have five, ten black people killed by the police and you will have an uproar. Huh? In this country, you can kill thousands of Muslims, nobody cares. This is the Dalits, anything you can have here. So we know that, and yet, you have this thing here, at the level, quite stable. Huh? They come to power, they accept it over here, all that here. You continue to have it. Now, I said stability. Whenever you had a continuing at the macro level, for 25, 30 years, and it is not, uh, that it is never enduring in university. I say this and I said Chile is an example. Huh? What is Chile? Chile had liberal democracy for a much longer period than India did since 1947. Chile was one of the few Latin American countries that has a much longer history. And it only got overturned at the macro level in 1973. Huh? And only much later has it been reversed. Huh? Chile proves the rule. Because what was the big threat which led to a military dictatorship? It was the growing power of the working class movement. That was the big threat. My point here is that this question of a reversal of democracy, uh, its connection to the working class movement is also related to What does this do? It connects me, rightly or wrongly, to the classical traditions of Marxism which insist that the question of fascism has to be connected to the question of working class power and the threat that they pose. And if that is not the case there, then what? So what am I saying here? I am saying that far right ultra-nationalism today tries to homogenize and restrict democracy to inferiorize target groups but not to completely destroy democracy. Now many people here in India would say that this is probably a better characterization of what is likely here. Huh? And they will have, but they will hammer Muslims and they will hammer others and all that. But they may, especially in the international context in which they need international capital, and of course from other countries and all the rest of us say. But they can still say that this is fascism and this is a very good fascism. And I'm not going to get worked up about that, etc. The question of how to fight it and more and more. But that's my understanding. Uh, you now have a lot of people saying in India, well, it's quasi-fascist, semi-fascist, this that. These are hyphenated fascisms. What does the hyphenated fascism suggest to be? It suggests unease huh? and pugnacity. Unease, not quite fascist. No, no, we are right, it's fascist. Huh? I suggest that it's better to talk about potentially fascist. Of course, they're horrible, they've got features, they have potential. But what would make the fascist is not simply the nature of the organization, organism by whole unity of three moments in terms of the context in which it comes about, the threat of the working class movement and so on. Marxists believe in the recurring possibility of fascism. Why do they believe in the recurring possibility of fascism? Because they connect it to the question of capitalism. As long as there is going to be capitalism, there is going to be a threat uh, here. Some Marxists insist that this is really about advanced capitalist countries because fascism is not simply the most terrible form of national reaction, it's also the most extreme form of international reaction. Okay, leave that aside. But, nevertheless, huh, they would say, it's always a potential there. It is when fascism, I'm sorry, when capitalism is, a, in other words, capitalism must be understood as a counter-revolution, as a necessity for the dominant classes, because Marxists, unlike liberals, do connect it to the question of rule by the bourgeoisie. I'm sorry, most Marxists. Those who have a fascinating within us who 
will not necessarily be bothered about that. But most boxes will connect it to the question of protecting the ruling classes in some way. Huh? So, the question of potentially Sorry. Sorry. Huh? I'm uh, okay. I've got some good news for you and some bad news for you. Huh? The good news is that I've only got two more slides. I'm finishing. The bad news is that although I said I'm finishing, not yet. Huh? Okay. Hindutva. Huh? Trotsky made a very perceptive point in my view when he said that the form of bourgeois rule is very much connected to the self-consciousness of the middle class or petty bourgeoisie. Marxists used to say that the most important social base for Hitler and Mussolini was the petty bourgeoisie. Huh? Actually, more research since then has shown this to be mistaken. Both Hitler and Mussolini had a much stronger multi-class base. Yes, what is called the middle class or the petty bourgeois was very much committed to it, but it had more support than you give it credit for even below that. Huh? But Trotsky's point was that the most important stable social base for the ruling classes is the middle class. And remember that in the Hitler period and Mussolini period, their hostility to the Weimar Republic, to democracy, and their support for the fascist movement and the fascist party and all was absolutely central to them. Huh? Similarly, and they felt squeezed because of the power of the working class. But in India, everybody recognizes that the working class is not squeezing the middle classes or whatever. It's extremely weak. Huh? And the uh, consciousness of that, the form of this thing here, is uh, related much more to that. Again, it's a way of saying about the danger represented to the form of bourgeois rule. One of the interesting things about India, which is both the strength of the ruling class and its problem, is India you have movements of all kinds, everywhere. But bourgeois democracy's great advantage over a highly centralized form of rule, like for example in China and elsewhere, is that there are different kinds of nodes of authority. So you have had remarkable movements in India. The women's movement, this movement, that movement, this movement. But in bourgeois democracy, because you have multiple authority systems in many ways, these movements get directed here, they get directed there, they get directed here. In other words, the sheer scale of India and the diversity it has means that these movements attack this, attack that. But in China or in Stalin or even in Gorbachev's Soviet Union, etc. Everything is much more centralized, so that your local struggle, etc., is a much more likely by look at Eastern Europe to get connected to the threat of the center, etc. In other words, what happens in a bourgeois democracy is that the threat that is represented by popular struggles and movements of every type gets diffused. It gets diffused. That's one of the great strengths of bourgeois democracy. Uh, that's something that's very important. So, it's in many ways, uh, but, uh, this thing here. Huh? At the same time, it's a weakness because India is a huge bloody continent. It's like a continent. It is a continent. In fact, look at the question of language. Huh? Europe has the same territory as South Asia. Huh? Same territory size. It has a lower population. It has less religious diversity. It has less linguistic diversity. It has less diversity in fauna and flora, less diversity topographically and climate. But Europe is called a continent and we are called a subcontinent. <coughs> the use of language huh? in various ways. Huh? This again. But anyway, my point here is that this diversity of India also makes a huge problem for any party to establish a very strong degree of centralized rule. India. And this is going to be a problem for the BJP. The unfortunate thing is that one of the biggest barriers, and they are growing, they are expanding, they are far right, we are very worried about all that. But on one hand, we have a weakness of opposition forces. On the other hand, this objective diversity rather than the strength of the struggle against it is one of the biggest obstacles to them being able to establish their rule. Huh? 
I am suggesting that rather than put what is happening in India and the Sangh Parivar into the category of a variant of fascism, right? Fascistic features, far right, most dangerous force we've had so far, uh, much more serious than all that, all fine. I would put it into another category, general category, which I say really emerges after the 1970s, the late 1970s. And what you will notice is that in the period after 1945 to late 1970s, this was a period where everywhere there was some optimism about the future. Huh? Even in third world countries that have become newly decolonized. Huh? We will make the future. All that was there. We will they say, we'll go ahead, we'll take the best of this, that, whatever. There was confidence. Most of the resistance movements and others were secular. In that part of the world where you now have Islamic fundamentalism, you had Nasserism, you had Baptism, huh? you had uh, 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 the PLO. Huh? These were all secular movements. Huh? It is only after Nasserism was enormously popular. Yeah. It's only after their decline uh, that you begin to have other kinds of movements. And what is noticeable is after the late 1970s onwards, you have a politics of cultural exclusivism emerging everywhere. Now this is connected. What are these politics of cultural exclusivism? Ethnicity, religion, nation. Uh, and they happen worldwide. Once again, what am I saying? I am saying that also look at the rise of the, of the BJP and some because up to the early 70s they were going nowhere. They got support from the JP movement but they have been trying to talk about the transformation of India for decades since 1925. They were there, there and then they begin to rise here. And you begin to see the rise of all kinds of movements everywhere, worldwide. The politics of cultural exclusivism taking what forms? <coughs> the form of Hindu uh, uh, communalism, the form of Islamic communalism, but what about Christian fundamentalisms? What about Judaic fundamentalism? What about Buddhist revanchism? Whether you're talking about Burma or whether you're talking about Sri Lanka and the shameful role that has been played by the Buddhist Sangha there, etc. What do you find in the uh, former Second World? The irredentist nationalisms bitter fighting in ex-Yugoslavia, the fighting that's taking place in the, uh, what do you call it, uh, ex ussr the shock of all of us in the 1970s and 1980s of fratricidal wars between countries that call themselves socialists. Huh? Huh? China, uh, Russia, China uh, attacking Vietnam in 1979, Vietnam and, uh, and Kampuchea. All of these things taking place, the bitter hostilities even earlier between Yugoslavia and Russia, this, all of these things were taking place. And what did you find in the first world? The rise of anti-immigrant xenophobia and racism. You find all of these things taking place at a global scale. I am saying that the main causes after the late 1970s for this international phenomenon, which then gets refracted huh, in different ways, huh, through national and regional specificities, but they have a common general cause which uh, uh, expresses itself and shapes itself in very specific uh, characteristics. I'm saying developmental failures, spreading but thinning of democracy and ideological disarray. What are the great differences? And this is something we have to, on the left, have to recognize and accept is today the only force that has dedicated, ideologically committed cater are the sub and their various associations. Huh? You know what has happened to the mainstream left, which once upon a time had ideologically committed Kedar in Kerala and West Bengal and all that here. What is important for a Kedar force? This, I think, is the difference between the far left and the far right on one side and other parties. For the far left and the far right to gain and to expand and to become more powerful within a bourgeois electoral democratic framework, what is most important is not what they do inside the bourgeois democratic framework for electoral framework, it's what they do outside in terms of mobilization, this thing here. And this is true for the far left, and this is true for the far right. 
The sun today is the one force that has its cadres in the pores of civil society and what it is doing outside the electoral political arena is what also helps it to gain within the electoral political arena. Once upon a time, the left, at least in certain regions of India, had this kind of capacities and ideologies and what they did outside was what actually helped to propel them there. We are not like, the far left and the far right are not like your mainstream right and left, etc. Which operate this day here, which will dilute their program. Both of them should have. To talk now about the mainstream left as far left, of course, doesn't make sense. That's one uh, obvious point. But what the far left and the far right have, both of them, is a profoundly transformative vision of the kind of society they want. One which is very reactionary, the other, of course, what we subscribe to. And that transformative vision comes from having cadres who are mobilized. And what is the big difference today between the cadres of, of the left, revolutionary cadres of the left worldwide? During the period when fascism was the biggest threat worldwide, as well as in other countries, this is there. The left cadre which is faced with this phenomenal fascism said, doesn't matter. We will fight, we may die, we may not succeed, but the future belongs to us. Today, uh, it is the cadres of the far right who say, the future in India belongs to us. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the transition in China, how many can say what they used to say at the time of the darkest hour of fascism, that the future belongs to us. In other words, the point I'm trying to make is that that commitment and that struggle is connected to the question of morale. A morale based upon a belief that the future belongs. Why? Because of your understanding and your ideological commitment and all the rest of it. Today, there is no way that the far left in India can go without the development of those, in my view, development of those cadres, that ideological commitment that comes from thinking that, okay, we're going to fight, doesn't matter. Not in my time, but in my children's and children's time or whatever future, or that we must fight because otherwise it's a disaster in all the rest of the year. So that's there. Yeah. Uh, the question of how do we fight here? Sorry, I haven't used this for a long time. So. <laughs> so, the question of alliance is strategic and tactical. Huh? Historically, there was a debate, a divide between what was called the popular front to fight fascism and the united front. That Paul LeBlanc came here and talked about the United Front and the Popular Front, yes. right? He talked about that. So I don't need to go into that, but very briefly, the United Front notion, both are basically tacked in this here, is that you have to unite those parties which are based on the working class uh, here. And you wait caution. Or if you like, in a more agrarian setting like India, or workers and peasants, those who are most oppressed, you have to build here, right? But in India, Unlike in Europe, huh? not the United States, but in Britain, Europe, elsewhere, etc., you had a few parties that had a solid working class base. Huh? Here, in fact, you have bourgeois parties that have a much larger base among others here than even the left parties have within that here. So, realistically speaking, if you are going to recognize that we have to fight against the sun, but I say it is far right, and I say that the Congress is right, but the distance between the two is still very big. Uh, and at the same time, the Congress has paved the way for the BJP to come to power. They have done all sorts of terrible things here. At the same time, they are not the same. Uh, so you have this dilemma. All the other parties, most of them, are very totally cynical. They are not all other. I mean, CPM and others have been bad in many ways, but they are not like your uh, Nadish uh, or your Mayamatis and the others who had no problems in the past uh, aligning itself with the BJP whatever it is, right? And you have also, okay, well I has not done it, but you can certainly do it here. You have the Congress, of course, national parties was not likely, but the point is this thing here, is that you have all of these things here, but yet in India, there is no getting away that you have to have some kind of a tactical popular front at some times to fight it. But what kind of alliance? Can you trust all these people? Who you are going to have alliance? What is a tactical alliance? A tactical alliance is for a specific cause, a specific issue, for a specific time. And even when you have alliances, what it's very tricky how to handle alliances. When you have alliances for anything, huh? a single issue or a particular issue or whatever, what unites you is more important than what divides you. You have to recognize that. At the same time, huh? there is always a certain principle of what is called march separately and strike together. 
there also has to be the freedom for you, even within the context of accepting a certain unity, to also be able to put your own perspective forward. Huh? Yeah. But you have to handle this very carefully. You can't have it in a united front for some specific issue, attacking those allies, etc. But at the same time, you have to differentiate yourself. Our perspective is not the same as theirs. We are joining for this particular issue or whatever, but this is the way that we have to go forward here. But you have to have some kind of way. In the Indian context, there is a short-term struggle, there is a longer-term struggle, right? The short-term struggle, uh, let me take, uh, uh, I'll come to that short-term and long-term struggle here. But uh, one is that we do have, to have some kind of a popular front. But the short-term struggle, for example, is which is the political party in India that is expanding regionally? Huh? Sorry? Aam Aadmi Party and the BJP. These are the only two parties that have expanded a little bit. But we are not sure about the Aam. We'll have to see what happens in Goa and what happens in uh, Punjab. Huh? Uh, uh, I'm a Punjabi as you know. I come from a Sikh background. Huh? Uh, you would probably have recognized me as being Punjabi because I hope I look intelligent. So people who look intelligent, you can automatically say they're from Punjab. <laughs> But my point uh, is, uh, is that we'll have to wait and see. If they expand it, the other party with ups and downs has been the BJP. Once upon a time, it was not in Karnataka. Today, I'm being told that it's growing in Karnataka. It's near in Assam. Pukok Rook, Arunachal Pradesh. Huh? It suffered in UP where it was strong because of the limited energy. But Haryana, Jammu, uh, Kerala is made a real road. Tamil Nadu, after uh, 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 Jailand and this thing here, and this thing here, it can look towards the right? If it wins in UP and others, it's bad. We know that. If it loses some breathing space, what is our perspective for even in the short term having that breathing space? But the longer term struggle is a much more serious one here. And what I'm saying here is that what is the relationship of neoliberalism to neo, I'm sorry, Hindutva to neoliberalism? If you like the question of the international and national reaction, because understand neoliberalism as characterizing not a state of affairs but a certain direction that the economy is taking everywhere. Huh? If you see it as a direction, then you will re realize that different countries are starting at different points and have different histories, and they are moving in that direction in uneven ways, pace, sequencing. But they are moving in that direction, but there will be differences in the state of affairs. Europe, including uh, Scandinavia, are moving in a neoliberal direction, but they have a very different history and starting point from the United States. And therefore things are still better there in terms of social democracy and all than there are in the United States. China and India are both moving in a neoliberal direction, but there are great differences in what it means in terms of the state of affairs, but they are moving in that direction. But you cannot have a right-wing movement on the economic level without, it cannot be stable unless you also have a, uh, a right-wing politics and ideology. And we are going to continue to live in this world in which you have on one hand a globalizing capitalism whose basic feature today is neoliberalism and you are going to continue to have a multiple nation state system. And the stabilization will take different forms in different regions, in different countries. That political and ideological stabilization will much more reflect the national and regional specificities of different countries. So there is a connection, if you like. Huh? I hesitate to use the word dialectic because it's a very tricky word. But if you want to impress people, always say dialectic. <laughs> so, dialectic of international and national. Okay. Right? But I'm saying that. But anyway, without using the word dialectic, I hope I've got my point uh, across. So please allow me like this also. So try to be more impressive by saying dialectic. <laughs> anyway, my point is, so you've got this kind of relationship here. So you have to situate the processes. In my view, and I've just uh, uh, written a book which will be coming out in, uh, abroad in about three months. Uh, uh, three months and then uh, uh, I'll get an Indian publisher here to bring it out in three, four, four, five months also. It's on this issue of uh, Hindutva and communalism and fascism and all that. And I can tell all of you if you're interested 
how you can get the book free. Uh, uh, you are interested in that. All you have to do to get it free is to please put your hand into the pocket of the person sitting next to you, steal as much money as you can, and then buy the damn book. <laughs> anyway. Neoliberalism. Uh, oh, sorry, neoliberalism. <laughs> pocket, pocket level, neoliberalism. <laughs> you then in another pocket, yeah. <laughs> Is that that I understand today the corporates are all they're all prepared to go uh, along with the BJP various it's also understand. Look at the change from the uh, corporate uh, character of fascism in power, the corporate the state, the, the economy capitalist, but here look at the change from the economic nationalism of the RSS and others to what they are now here. So now the RSS and Sri Jagran much has given some stops. Yeah, yeah, we are opposed to this, that, etc. But otherwise, Modi and all are very much committed to the whole question of neoliberalism. In fact, the difference between Modi and, and the uh, Congress on neoliberalism, economics, and foreign policy is not that much accelerated. Huh? There is difference. There is much more serious at the socio-economic, uh, 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 and cultural, and educational levels uh, here in terms of that over here. So they have to accelerate again. So not, not fascist communism, no economic nationalism. But if we are going to fight and defeat Hindutva in the long term, number one, it is a long term struggle. Number two, important as it is that it should not win in state elections and other elections in 2019, etc. The longer term struggle is on the terrain of civil society. That's a long term struggle. They are the only force today in my view that has the largest implantation in the pores of civil society to a whole range of cadres and associations of various kinds. And they have been flexible enough to change. For example, what has happened to them is that the RSS, the Pracharics used to be the spinal cord of the RSS. The RSS still connects all the other associations here. But who nowadays, even if they are right-wing and young, want to be a full-time, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, Pracharik? and to remain sexually abstinent. Uh, very few young people uh, see the virtues, no matter how much Brahmacharis talk about it, this, that, etc. For some peculiar reason, young people don't, uh, they like sex for some strange reason. <laughs> yeah, but my point here is, so what does the RSS do? The RSS, you come and be a Pachari for three, four, five years, and then you go and have a family, we'll help you get a job. They're changing, they're now having trousers, as you know. The changing. What's happening is that uh, the associations of uh, 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 journalists for BJP, accountants for BJP, for BHP, all, all these things, they are growing in various ways, but they have their pores in civil society in various ways. That's the terrain we are going to have to fight, and we cannot fight uh, uh, this force is only on the level of secularism. It has to be an all-around fight. They have a transformative vision. And their weak spot today huh, is very much more these issues. I think the most important weak spots are the questions of jobs, whether it is UPA or whether it is there. They cannot provide enough decent jobs. They are not able to provide health and welfare and other things here. That is something that is very, very important. They cannot do so. No other government here. This will create resentments. But the fact that there is going to be resentment and frustration doesn't guarantee that they will lose out. I say this because it is living politics that will decide the direction that anger and frustrations will take place. Living politics in terms of what political activists do, etc. That will shape the direction of the anger and the frustration. You can't automatically assume because of these frustrations that they will uh, move away from that. And of course, it's a transformative budget at all levels. We have to fight it. I say this is the weak spot. We raise social democratic demands for two reasons. One is that if they are achieved to some extent, it's good. But the fact that they cannot be achieved within the existing framework also strengthens those who say, look, you can't get it now. We have to have a much more transformative vision in terms of moving. And caste is something that's very, very important. The anti-caste struggle is very important. They have learned the lessons. They are not only appropriating big shots like a baker and all to some degree of success, but they have also learned to try and appropriate because they felt they, 
at the local level, Dalits and Chinese have all kinds of local myths and local heroes and heroines and this, that, etc. They are also appropriating them as part of that process, etc. Yeah? And they can do that to some extent. It's still difficult for them. But the tragedy with much Dalit politics has been its identity politics. But you have somebody like Jignesh Mewani. Jignesh Mewani is very interesting. Because he is a person who says that we cannot simply succeed with identity politics. We must also understand the material basis. He comes from actually the left.